All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Angie Grise with the Resource Conservation District. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Matt Abernathy. Hello everyone, um, as Angie said, my name is Matt Abernathy. I am the Forest Health and Wildfire Resiliency Program Specialist with the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we wanted to thank you for everyone who turned up and our sincere condolences for any and all of those who were affected by the CZU fire. Um, our webinar is being um, hosted by the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County, as well as the RCD of San Mateo and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, the RCDs are, a lo are local agencies that bring people and resources together to care for the land, soil, water, and wildlife. Um, we hope that this webinar series provides a little bit more information about how you can um, better manage your natural resources and your property after after the fire. Um, some, a lot of people don't know about the RCDs, but we have been around since 1942. And um, we are a large, or we have been, sorry. Uh, we are, are trying to make a bigger presence for ourselves and really aid in post recovery efforts. Um, our, our specific tasks right now are producing webinars and other educational and outreach series such as this, as well as providing technical assistance to local landowners. Um, along with our other partners, the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, we are providing confidential site visits at no cost to look at landowners' needs in addressing the impacts of, of this fire. Um, with that, I am now going to hand it over back to Angie, who is our communication specialist at the RCD of Santa Cruz. Um, take it away, Angie. <laughs> Without further ado, I will turn it over to Steve Otten and I'll let him introduce himself. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Otten and uh, with ARC, and I'd also like to introduce uh, Shelby Chronic, too, who is a, an assistant forester with ARC, who will be helping out, um, likely fielding some chat questions maybe as they come in, along with Matt and Angie. and. Um, well, um, a little background about myself before um, I start sharing the presentation here is that um, um, I've been a forester in the Santa Cruz Mountains for about 20 years, and I was um, a forester at Big Creek Lumber Company for about my first five years, and then ultimately became operations manager at Cal Poly Swanton Pacific Ranch for about 14 years. And that's where, um, myself and many others and a lot of other residents at that time went through the 2009 Lockheed fire and um, did a lot of restoration and rehabilitation work and a lot of research work and watched that forest um, regrow for quite a few years and actually just left there last year to um, start working on this new endeavor with uh, forestry and fuels and resource management with ARC. So, um, you know, one other thing I want to just mention here a little bit too is a, a very grateful thank you to RCD uh, Santa Cruz County and also RCD San Mateo. Um, it's really just been amazing to watch their mobilization efforts right now and trying to get information out to uh, neighbors and others and starting site visits so quickly to try to deliver information out there because if there's one thing I definitely noticed about the 2009 Lockheed fire is there was a lot to understand and there was a lot to understand really quickly and people want to make decisions and you need information to do that. So uh, glad and honored to be a part of this. And, you know, just another quick reflection. I'm, I'm pretty sure that probably most of the people that are on this presentation right now either lost a home or they're closely connected to someone who did. And, um, and I can certainly, um, recognize that and it's definitely a big reason why all of us are here and we're trying to get information so i'm gonna i'm gonna move forward i'm gonna share my screen now and get this uh presentation up and running here and just double checking angie can you see the presentation screen yep okay i'll take that as a guess so so um so yes. forest regeneration <laughs> Thanks, Angie. So forest regeneration and evaluating tree mortality following wildfire. And um, so, and this is really the reason why we're, 
why we're here is trying to move this slide forward here. So this is a picture of the CZU complex fire, and uh, it was taken on Tuesday, August 18th, around 4.30 in the afternoon. And um, this is the smoke plume coming out of Butino State Park. And this is the smoke plume coming out of, of the Butino. And over here would be about where the Waddell is. And you could definitely see that um, there was a lot that was about to start happening. So, um, and to make that just a little bit more clear here, make sure that I'm going to open this up and assuming that thumbs up on that we can see that okay so this is a progression that's starting to show the lightning strikes that showed up early Sunday morning right that's what all these red dots are to show the fire progression and then once we start hitting Monday we'll see the yellow spots and then they begin to grow a little bit more and it was sometime at this point around Tuesday evening from what I understand that between about 9.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. next morning kind of varies around this, but about a nine to 12 hour window, the fire grew uh, approximately 44,000 acres and that's the next polygon that we're going to see. And each one of these polygons are really just showing the progression of the fire. So we're going to kind of go through that and there's the 44,000 acres and then it begins to expand out and you can watch the date in this portion of the screen to see that expansion just to set the stage for what happened and um, definitely historic in that regard. So I'll let that finish out and we'll escape out of that just to kind of set the stage for what we want to show here. Let me get this presentation back up and Okay, assuming we're pretty good, if we have the presentation back up, yes? Okay, great. So, so, um, so the first thing that we really want to do is, so let's take a look at our, um, is, is we, we need to think about this setting. We had the burn and then um, everybody's probably starting to see these photos a lot now. And this is a photo that was taken in the, almost the top of the Butno Creek uh, watershed and um, it burned with a very high severity and just over the top of this road that's up there starts Big Basin Park. And this photo was taken probably two weeks and three or four days after the fire moved through here. So there's hope, right? We're seeing that regeneration start to happen in a small uh, scale, even with the highest levels of severity. And then this next photo, that's my son, Daniel, and uh, he started doing a lot of work for me this spring and, and summer. And we are in a location in the Los Gatos Creek watershed that has a, a very high burn severity level. And you can see um, that this tree is pretty well hollowed out and it's from the 1985 Lexington fire. So um, quite a few years since that has passed and uh, this area burned very hot. And some of these limbs up on this tree um, probably did not sprout. You know, redwoods are known for sprouting up the bowl and out on their limbs following fire. Um, and it probably sprouted some limbs just on the outside edges of the tree that ultimately became new limbs on this tree. So just keep that in mind. So from the time of the fire's inception, just a couple weeks later to many years later, and sort of what this range is that we're kind of thinking about as we evaluate these things today. So, so let's talk about our objectives. And um, our first real objective for today's presentation is to help landowners understand burn severity, forest regeneration, and the basics for assessing tree mortality on coastal tree species following wildfire to support informed decision-making regarding tree removal. That's one of our, that's probably our main objective, right? And we're gonna show burn severity versus forest regeneration in different forest types following the 2009 Lockheed fire and also there's been a lot of foresters and a lot of people and resource professionals starting to get out in the 2020 CZE Lightning Complex. So um, you'll be seeing some photos that are probably first shown here um, uh, from some of those fire areas. And then uh, we're going to provide information on assessing mortality in coastal tree species following wildfire. And I, and I want to be careful about this difference in designation between assessing mortality in trees and or assessing damage or hazard tree removal. The purpose of this presentation is to really 
give you some of the characteristics and things to think about um, to see where there might be an issue and consider um, how you want to approach um, either calling someone or taking some steps to maybe handle that issue. So we're not necessarily looking at the specific characteristics for a hazard tree remo removal, but more really about what, what keeps them living and what are indications that they're not going to live, right? So, um, but there's a few definitions that we have to go through if we're gonna have this conversation together tonight, right? And so the first one is about burn severity. We need to understand what burn severity means, right? We're gonna, we're gonna, well, I'm gonna explain this before I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do, but, um, what it is is that based on the degree of scorch on tree trunks, right, on the bowl of the tree or that tree cylinder as it goes up to those limbs is that is how high that scorch is and how hot that scorch is on the tree, how much of that bark gets burned up towards the limbs. And then the amount of vegetation that is burned, which could be on those trees or the vegetation surrounding it. And then the percentage of that vegetation is dead, right? That higher severity fire, that level of severity obviously has a huge impact on the mortality of trees, right? And the other one we want to understand is fuel loading, right? This is the weight of vegetative fuels indicating trees and brush, I'm sorry, including trees and brush per acre, right? And so the way I think about maybe explaining is this, if you take an acre and that's 208 feet by 208 feet, and if I was actually able to take my arms and put it around all those trees and brush and pick it up and put it on a scale, that is what the fuel load is. That's the weight of vegetative fuels. And maybe metaphorically for a relationship, a good way to think about it is if you have your wood stove at home or you have your fireplace and you have your fire in there and it's starting to burn down and you're like, wow, I want to produce some more heat. So I grab some more wood from my uh, firebox or, or whatever and I bring that in and I throw it on the fire and I add that wood weight to the fire and that higher fuel load produces more heat. That's what fuel load is, right? So we have burn severity, fuel loading, and we'll probably talk just a little bit about fire behavior, how fuel ignites, flame develops, and fire spreads, right? Probably our biggest controlling factor there is obviously wind, right? We know that this was a significantly wind-driven fire and it moved super fast. It had low humidity levels and there was a lot of steepness and topography, which all affects fire behavior, right? And we'll correlate some of that fire behavior back to burn severity and then to mortality. So the next term is cambium. And cambium is a super important part of the tree that essentially is a cellular plant tissue that creates cell division, which develops the tree, right? And it's really like a, as important as many aspects are, cambium is a really important component to the tree living or dying associated with wildfire. So that we have the xylem, right? This cambium creates both xylem and phloem, right? And it, it, the cambium is located in between the cylinder of wood of the tree and the bark. And I'll show you another picture of this to explain it further. But that xylem that developed off the cambium that's growing the tree is ultimately kind of like the heart of the tree, right? It's pushing that water up into the tree, of taking nutrients up into the tree. But the phloem is what's bringing the photosynthetic activity from those leaves and needles and producing those sugars and pumping that back down. That's kind of like the lungs of the tree that's pushing it back out to the limbs, right? So this is the critical component that creates these, which you have to have or the tree is not gonna make it, okay? And we'll talk about that more. We're just kind of exposing ourselves to these definitions right now. And the next one is diameter at breast height, right? And we're gonna use the term DBH. And this is essentially a measurement of a tree diameter at 4.5 feet above the ground measured from the uphill side of the tree. So you might have a slope and here's the tree and you're standing on the uphill side of the tree and you wrap a tape around that tree and that tape will measure the diameter because we know that surface area of a smaller tree is not as uh, resistant to fire as a larger tree with greater surface area. So we also think about categories of tree diameter um, as well as their species too, which play obviously a huge role in their survivability from wildfire. So burn severity, fuel loading, fire behavior, cambium, and diameter of breast height are just some important definitions. So what we're gonna break into right now is we're just gonna go right into burn severity. And I'm gonna show you a few photos here from the 2009 Lockheed fire 
that um, where we're just going to broadly talk about severity so we can start identifying it. That's one of the important goals for this talk is for landowners to be able to identify a level of severity to know where they might have problems, right? So if we look down in this drainage here, we have lots of green canopy trees and that fire was probably on the ground there and maybe didn't burn um, too hot in that area. So those those crowns are still alive. As we proceed out of this drainage, we can see a transition zone where there's a few ground trees and some green. That's probably a moderate level of severity. And as we get into the trees up on the ridge where the trees begin to turn more brown, we're starting to really hit a high level of severity. And then as we get up into these ridge tops, right, these are a much higher level of sever severity. And from top to bottom, you know, common coastal species you'd see might be knob cone pine and chaparral stands. As we work into our hardwood and Douglas fir stands with some redwood mixed and get further and further down into the creeks where we might be predominantly redwood, right? So let's look at another side and think about severity. So again, this green area in the bottom is probably low severity, but it looks like a pretty quick transition into moderate severity and then ultimately high severity where many of the leaves and needles are completely brown and then a very high severity, right? Where we see full consumption and basically a matchstick like format. And next one to help identify severity, we have this, um, again, low fire severity area, moderate, and then we break into high and then a very high severity where we have full consumption. So, so now what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take each one of these severity levels, four of them that we're gonna talk about, low, medium, high, and very high, and break them down and talk about some of the characteristics that you might see. And then we'll show a, a few photos after each one, because that's the page we wanna get everybody on here is to be able to recognize what the level of severities are too. So let's talk about low burn severity. And I want you to know that when I was characterizing this, like how is this conversation gonna come across something? We all have different sort of forested settings that we live in, but it's probably safe to say that most of the areas that we're surrounded by are moderate to a thick forested setting, right? So what you might see for a low burn severity might be that bark of the tree is burned at the base and extended up the tree approximately five feet in some cases. Some trees under four inches diameter breast height will die, but likely not be consumed by the fire. They might just kind of lean over. Um, with some um, brown leaves on them to some degree. Understory brush and herbaceous plants are not consumed or they might be partially consumed by fire. And that most trees larger than four inches in diameter will survive unless a ground fire concentrates around the base of the tree and or the roots. And, um, and the kind of ash you might see is gray and black ash. So we're gonna put up a photo. This is from the 2020 CZU fire and you know, I would predominantly consider this a, a low burn severity. Um, that's how I would identify this. There might be some moderate severity here, but there's still a lot of brown and there's some, um, you know, five foot or less in that arena burn. Um, a lot of the forest floor debris is not consumed. I can actually see some green vegetation. And up in the crowns, the crowns are in pretty good shape and there's a pretty good distance between the forest floor here and those crowns. A little bit of browning over here too. So that would be a low burn severity level just broadly. And you'll find that people interpret these subjectively and kind of end up with their own range in some cases, but we're going to operate right in that realm. So then we have a moderate burn severity, again, in a moderate to thick forest setting. The bark of the tree is burnt at the base and, and extends up to a third of the tree height, potentially, in some of our taller trees, maybe up to a half in some cases. And so that's half the tree height. So that tree grows out of the ground and depending on how tall it is, it might be a third to half of that height where we're increasing in our scorch up the trees and our vegetation consumption. Now in moderate burn severities, you can see a range here. Many trees, most trees under four inches in DBH will die, but will may or may not, will likely not be consumed by fire. This is that subjectivity I'm trying to operate around right now. Uh, some understory brush, herbaceous plants and some debris are consumed by fire. Um, some thin bark species in the four to eight inch DBH range may also die, right? That's a big component of survivability is our thin bark species like our bay trees and our madrones or big leaf maples or red alders or California nutmegs. Those trees are thin bark species and although they may be sprouters, they're highly susceptible to burn severity too. Our redwoods obviously do a lot better with their sprouting capability and our Doug firs and Monterey pines and knob cones are a little bit different beast, but we'll talk about them a, a bit here. 
So most trees larger than eight inches and DBH survive unless again, ground fire concentrates around the base of the tree and the roots too. Ash color is black and orange with some white ash, right? So let's take a look at a few photos. Again, 2020 CZU, predominantly a moderate burn severity, some might say even low, uh, but as we look in the back, we can see those scorch heights in some cases extending up to a third of the height. We have a partial consumption here. This might be called a dirty burn a little bit where it's not super clean um, and some debris burning at the bottom. Crowns are predominantly still intact. Um, another photo from moderate comes from our uh, 2020 CZU. And here we see um, a little more clear in the understory, at least here on the front side with our scorch heights coming up about a third of the height of the tree. Predominantly the crowns are intact and there are probably a lot of smaller trees in here that will exhibit a, high, a higher degree of mortality in that you know four inch-ish type range. So that's sort of our medium severity. Now we're gonna kind of take off into a high, high burn severity, right? In a moderate to thick forested setting. The bark of the tree burned could be over half its height or all the way to the top. And the leaves and needles of, of all tree diameters are, are brown with likely some level of consumption. So many trees under 12 inches in DBH uh, will die from this high burn severity fire, especially those that are not sprouting species. Most understory brush, herbaceous plants and debris are consumed by fire. And there'll be pockets where you don't see that. I mean, these severities, you can see on the map that they have this odd sort of continuity that are influenced by so many of the fire behavior factors. So we'll have variable mortality for sprouting tree species above 12 inches, except for redwood where survival will be much higher. Most Douglas fir, Monterey pine and knobcone pine will expire in high severity fires, especially if their entire crown is brown or, or it can even have, you know, 30% of a green crown uh, is certainly an indicator that uh, it's probably not looking good for that, that kind of species. So orange and white ash is sort of common on, on what you see on the ground. Let's take a look at a couple photos. So although this shows probably a more low to moderate fire behavior here, there's a super steep canyon down in the bottom where this fire came out of the top super hot. And, and actually that fire got up into the middle of these trees. You can see some scorch height <clears throat> that's uh, above middle or half, but these whole, all of these trees are brown. They're all redwoods. And I'll tell you that they, um, that they regenerated, they sprouted on their outside. We lost most of the smaller trees in here, but that um, interestingly, there was some damage at the base of some of these trees in here and, and two or three of these larger diameter trees did expire. And that's where some of that compounded damage sometimes comes in. So this next photo is from the 2020 CZU. It's in the upper Butano drainage. And this is probably on the verge of um, high severity, or I'm sorry, very high severity, but we're gonna use it in high severity because it has a, a really important component to it where there's a big drainage that's down here in the bottom and there was a wind that came out of here and it started blowing so hard that it grabbed these needles and as the moisture was volatilized essentially from the heat of the flame, it pushed those limbs up and turned them and it froze them in place. So. What's happening on the bottom half, bottom half in the portion of this upper tree is that we call that frozen needle, right? So that's an indicator of fire behavior that that fire came through pretty hot. And I can tell you that, that most of the trees that are not redwoods in here are probably not going to make it. Maybe some of the larger diameter um, uh, oaks, coast live oaks, and some tan oaks will do well, but the thin bark species are going to have a real tough time in a severity level like this. So, and then we go to a very high burn severity, right? And this is where you saw we're kind of going into matchsticks. Things are getting super hot, moderate to thick forested setting. The back of the tree is burned to the top. The bark of the tree is burned to the top of all trees. Leaves and needles entirely consumed or almost. And uh, most trees that are not redwoods will die, especially non-sprouting species. Large burl forming root systems from redwoods, hardwoods, and chaparral will survive and grow again. Um, all understory brush, herbaceous plants, and most debris are consumed by fire. And um, most redwood trees below 12 inches DBH will experience high mortality. The majority of redwood trees over this DBH will live with some low variable mortality where fire might be concentrated, like in that example we showed you before. But again, really low, we can expect a high survival rate. The trees that survive will experience structural defects through root loss or other tree bull damage that, take a, that take, can take a long time to heal. And, um, and the ash in here is white ash like snow. So 
I'm walking you through, again, this low, moderate, high, and very high. And you can see they're, they're scalable, right, as we sort of walk through this, that they're kind of tiered in those severities. And we're going to look at some photos here again now. So this is another picture of, of likely more of a high severity setting. But again, this has that frozen leave. I called it frozen needle. This fire came out of that watershed and it turned and it froze those leaves in place. So we know we're dealing with a higher severity fire. There's probably, I think this is a large coast live oak here that's probably got a chance of survival. We'll see some photos of coast live oaks trying to recover further on in this presentation. So, but definitely some very high severity up here in these crowns, um, a little bit of a mixed bag. So do you guys remember that picture at the beginning of the presentation where I showed those redwoods regenerating out of the ground? That was at the base of this grove that burned in very high severity. And again, this is at the top of the watershed of the Butino uh, Creek drainage and Big Basin is just on the other side. Very high severity fire in here. And um, likely all these large trees will probably make it. A lot of the smaller stuff is, is not going to do well too. So. Uh, next photo here. This is kind of that upper watershed. I wanted to at least show you a photo of what the knob cone pine um, looks like in the upper watershed, um, likely with manzanita surrounding it. And remember, knob cone pine is a, is a fire adapted species and their cones open uh, when fire shows up too. So these upper watersheds are going to see a high degree of occupation by knob cone pine regenerating. It'll literally be a carpet up there on top. So um, and so this one is pretty stark for me. This is a very high severity uh, photo, 2020 CZU um, lightning complex photo. And um, you can see that white ash and you can see that these trees were black all the way up. And, and we think that it may have been that a fire backed down this hill with lower fire conditions, who, who knows, maybe in the evening. But then the wind turned and it just, you know, may have grabbed a crown fire and came back over the top. You can see how it's sort of wind blown down slope here. And um, so most of the large trees will, will do well in here. They'll see some, you know, some structural issues likely, but they're probably going to live. And you can see that there's a huge amount of consumption uh, and um, there'll be impacts from that too. So, and so that's the very high burn severity. And but this next photo that I want to show you is, 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 I think it's important when we think about redwoods. So, you know, redwoods are a truly amazing species. And, you know, if we take humans, for instance, right, humans have two pairs of 11 different chromosomes. And um, Douglas fir trees, Monterey pines, they have two pairs of 11 different chromosomes, but not redwoods. Redwoods have six pairs of 11 different chromosomes. So when you think about the combinations and the ability they have to regenerate, it, it really is truly amazing. Like, I mean, they'll start growing a limb out and boy, that's getting a little bit too heavy. And all of a sudden they're like, well, we're just gonna, you know, we're just, we're a physicist. We're just gonna go ahead and fill that right in on the bottom. And um, so that they can build out in places that maybe normally other trees can't. Just the same, they can, they can also, you'll see some photos of smaller redwood trees that essentially look like they have died, but they've sprouted on the outside because their little axillary buds and, their, and how their genetics operate, they're able to sprout out on the side of those trees where there's still portions of live cambium and survive because of carbohydrate storage, flushing those needles out and being able to conduct some level of photosynthetic activity to hopefully in enough time for their roots to recover and those pieces of cambium that are alive to reconnect themselves. It, it's just amazing. So, and what we're seeing right here is that the 2009 Lockheed fire was burned by the 1948 Pine Mountain fire. And so that's what this is. This uh, person here uh, is, um, is basically running his fingers along a half cylinder of a dead tree that died in the 1948 Pine Mountain fire. And ultimately what happened is those leaves and needles popped out of the side or from the base, and they ultimately entombed this small 12 to 14 to 16 inch tree that actually died and grew a new tree around it. And, and it just, and we, and we, we definitely knew this as we were evaluating through the 2009 Lockheed fire. And the point that I just wanna make for people when they're thinking about mortality in their trees is that, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that this tree survives, but the structural integrity is somewhat in question as it continues to build out. So 
thinking about evaluating those a little bit closely, especially where they have compounded burns are really important, but I don't wanna take away at all from the survivability of redwoods. They're amazing. They're amazing physicists, but there are things that require um, some additional professional insight too. So, so keep that in mind. So that being said, um, now we're going to break out. We've, we went through all the severities, right? So you guys should be able to see a picture now. And that's what the polling test is, is that we're going to have a couple pictures that show up and you get to name the severity in the poll and we'll see how you do to find out whether I'm really delivering the information well to you. So the next segment is now we're going to talk a little bit about um, what, what are the collective factors that ultimately make a tree live or die, right, following wildfire. So we've talked about burn severity, right? And we have an understanding for those different levels of severities and what effects they can have on those trees, right? And then tree species and diameter, you know, different tree species react to fire differently and surface areas of diameters are super important too. But also there's that life-giving substance called cambium, cambium and how much tree cambium around the base of the tree is still alive kind of from the bottom up to the top where we measure dbh that's a critical location we're evaluating um, how much of the root system is burned out right because you got to have roots and how much of the tree canopy is still green and then at the last part of it which is one of our special things for our coastal species is how much of the tree canopy is sprouting right i touched on that once already where our sprouting species have this amazing capability to be able to sprout based on stored carbohydrates and start healing themselves by growing cambium out of those spots to close off some of those areas that were burned too hot, okay? So we're gonna move into these four sections next and here we go, right? We're gonna keep this going. How much cambium around the base of the tree is still alive? And how do we evaluate that? Well, from the 2009 Lockheed fire, there was a lot of foresters and a lot of people who got together to think about we need answers and people need to know what's going on for a number of different reasons. And so we decided to try to come up with some kind of strategy. And that's what I'm sort of indicating here is that this is the tree, right? This is the wood, right? Where the xylem predominantly occupies and the phloem over here, but this green line, and by the way, I just drew this green line. Cambium is not green. It's just to identify where the cambium is, right? And we know that depending on how much healing a tree has to do, if the wildfire burned so hot, burned the bark off and dried out the cambium and killed it in a quadrant, we're trying to identify how many quadrants of cambium out of four are still surviving and appear to be live, right? So, um, and, and how do we do this? Well, I mean, sometimes it's pretty obvious, right? You can see where the tree bark burned off, but, and, but it might be that the cambium's okay on the other side. So, I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and do this because this starts getting a little bit tricky, but you know, you don't want to cut into every single tree to evaluate what, how well the cambium is living or not. So what we end up doing is sounding the tree with, with another larger stick or sometimes the back of an ax. And, um, but you have to look up in the tree and make sure that there's not any limbs falling over you. So I'm, I'm just saying that there, this is how we do it, but these are professionals that are doing it. But when you hit the tree, if the cambium's still alive, you can hear a, you'll hear more of a thud, right? Because that cambium's acting as like a sponge in between the wood and the bark. Whereas um, when the cambium's dead, the tree will rain a little bit more. And that's also dependent on the thickness of the bark. And it takes a while to, to get a feel for that. But that's how we're, as professionals, trying to address some of um, what the cambium survival is, right? And then the other part that you might see, um, this photo was taken four to six months after the fires. You might start seeing some fungal growth in areas. And our evidence suggests essentially that this is likely dead areas of dead cambium in here. And, um, and as important in the same period of time, what we're seeing here is that this, this tree burned really hot and that there was dead cambium under here. And what happened over time, we can see this sort of yellow growth, but that cambium is under this bark right now. And it's trying to close off that area where the cambium died to seal it up, right? To sort of entomb that portion of dead wood like we saw in that log that was split in half. But don't be fooled. So on the other side of things in very high severity, sometimes, um, and we just had this discussion uh, recently uh, with um, some of our local foresters about we were seeing redwood trees in very high severity that were showing some of those splits that you might think could be, oh man, the, is the cambium already moving to try to seal it up? But that's not what was happening. The tree had burned so hot that 
um, that the, that it killed the cambium and it split the sapwood and that's what pushed the bark out. So you have to be a little bit careful in timing and, and evaluating to understand what the level of mortality is as it relates to the impacts of those cambium and what's really happening if it burns super hot or not, or if the cambium again is starting to push in this period to close off its wounds. So, um, so this is a great picture and this was taken by a forester in 2009. Uh, what we're looking at here is this is under a coast live oak. And um, this is the dead wood portion where the cambium was killed. And what's happening right now is that's cambium, right? Here's the wood, here's the bark, and this is cambium. It's rolling out like, I don't know, like clay or licorice. And it's, again, it's coming around to try to seal the tree and it's pushing the bark off too on the oak tree. So pretty amazing. So, um, so that's what we think about when we're evaluating cambium. And then the root system. We got to have the root system. So we'll um, be a, we'll come out to evaluate root systems in certain areas, and we can see that these roots tops are pretty exposed. We know where they go in the ground, and so we might be testing gently with a shovel or sometimes a small stick to see where the voids are. And of course, this tree is heavily burned out in its center. And um, you know, if you just look at this, you're saying, "Wow, the likelihood of survival doesn't look too good." Again, this is photo is four to six months after the Lockheed fire. Um, and I would caution you too that as you're looking around these places, you know, it's a time to be really careful walking out in the woods because there are ash pits and there are hot spots. And uh, we wear specialized gear when we're out there to make sure that if we step into something and that ground gives way and we go into an ash pit that we're protected. So that's another reason to show a great deal of caution. But here we can see where there are root voids, right? Where there were roots and um, and this bark was burned pretty heavily too. So we're trying to evaluate, gosh, what's the percentage of the roots are here? What capability have we as ultimately maybe reduced by the wildfire to the root system? Next one is how much of the tree canopy is still green? So I really like this photo. It's a low to moderate burn severity. And it's ultimately showing a coast live oak, uh, at least in the front as low to moderate. And it's showing a coast live oak. It's got a ton of good crown left on it. And the red polygon is 100% and whatever the black is, is that percent crown that's remaining. We can see a varied mix of green back in these coast live oaks. I'm sure that all these live oaks will probably be fine. It might experience a little increased level of defect. Um, but back beyond that, we have more of a high severity category. And these are probably maybe a hybridized Monterey pine knob cone or just knob cone. Um, but those needles all the way up at the top and all the way down, all these knob cones will definitely expire, right? So that's an important component. And then um, for sprouting species, again, I don't have to reiterate about the whole carbohydrate storage. It's, it's very impressive. Um, but this is probably 100% crown spouting that occurred about, I'm going to say um, around six months or so, or maybe a little bit more. I'm trying to recall that photo exactly. But you can see this tree right next to it is probably a Chan Oak and it's just not coming back, right? It just doesn't have the sprouting capacity as Redwood. So it's already, you know, increasing its level of survive, survivability just because of the mechanisms and how they grow and how they regenerate, right? So those are the four really important components of what makes a tree live or die. And that's what we evaluate to determine, to determine mortality, right, in our stands. So, and that correlates back to severity, right? So knowing the severity levels and understanding how we look at mortality should get you a few steps down the road to help making a, a, an informed decision about what to do next. So this next part is, um, I, I'm just, this is the, the mortality assessment model. And I don't want you to spend too much time looking at it because it's just way too confusing, but just identify that here we talk about the species, right? And we're, and now we're looking at the different diameter classes, right? Where we have greater surface area based on the DBH or lower surface areas. And this is where we're evaluating the cambium of quadrants or burn percent of roots or remaining canopy or canopy sprouting. And those are certain thresholds for mortality. And, and there's a certain level of subjectivity around our evaluation, but this sets a level of mortality that we used in the 2009 Lockheed fire. So, whew, okay, so the next part, uh, we've gotten through our first two stages, right? We probably have about 12 or, or maybe 14 minutes left here. Um, but now this, we are going to take a look at some photos in a series, right? All from the same place. One photo that's four to six months, one year, two years, and two and a half years. And, and Angie, this is where we're gonna start the poll. So 
And, and the question is going to be, is what level of burn severity is exhibited in the photo? So I'm going to put that photo up. And Angie, are we ready for the poll? Yes, we are. OK, so here comes the photo. So everybody put down what level of severity that they think this is. So. Um, Right. And then, and while you guys are, are putting your polls together and we see the answers to what level of severity you think this is, there's a lot of pain on these trees. And, and this um, is the, a continuous forest inventory that's on Cal Poly Swanton Pacific Ranch that um, has been in place since 1997. And we had completed a measurement cycle in 2008 so we knew what the status of all these trees were when they burned in 2009. So essentially we evaluated, there were 2,877 trees amongst um, all diameter classes and all species. We took the mortality table, we assessed all these trees to make a determination of whether we thought those trees were gonna live or they were gonna die based on the mortality assessment. And then we went back and checked them over a nine year period, five times to see whether we were right or not. And um, so that's, you're gonna see some paint here and I just wanted to tell you about it and a little background on the mortality work that was that was done there. So, oh, we have some uh, poll results coming in. This is, this is uh, very interesting how this works. Um, so we have, it looks like we have 55% who say high and we have 12% that say very high and a low and a medium. So. If I were to look directly into this stand right here, um, I would say that we're in a high or very high category. Um, as I look towards the back, I can see a moderate to maybe low level of severity. So it's always a range, and that's part of the picture that I want to try to get across is it, it can change pretty readily from spot to spot. But probably most of those people have said high uh, and or very high, this is, this is a pretty good idea. So. Um, so now we're going to look at the next three photos. So this is four to six months out. We can see leaf litter on the forest floor, some level of sprouting occurring. So um, this would be one year, simply. So this is one year. Look at the regenerative sprouts coming up just in one year in these redwoods. And um, next photo is two years. And these seedlings are at eye level. Um, almost at eye level right now after two years. And we can see that we do have a high degree of mortality in these redwood trees. And they're probably in the, you know, anywhere from 10 to 14 inch average diameter stand. Um, and then if we go to our next photo, now these seedlings are over our head in just two and a half years. So just an amazing amount of regenerative capability here too. So, um, so that's our first one. So now this is our next polling question. So everybody get ready. Angie, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So, um, so we're going to start off with the next photo that shows four to six months out following. This is the Lockheed fire recovery. And here we go. Let's everybody go ahead and, and uh, put in their answers. I put in my answer this time. And um, so we'll wait for the results of the poll. Everybody's kind of looking at this picture to get an idea of what they think the level of severity is. That's one of our goals. We want people to be able to look at the land, see the level of severity, and understand um, how they might need to think about their next steps, too. So I'll give that just a couple seconds. Wait for Angie to post the results. I'm going to let see if as many people. We're getting up there. People are still. It's a tough one. A it is. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to let it go for 10 more seconds and then I'm going to close it. Uh, I think we're good. All right. Okay. Sharing the results. There we go. Okay. You guys are doing well. So, <clears throat> um, I would say that um, definitely looking at the middle of the screen, I would say medium too. This is a moderate level burn severity. And uh, however, those people that answered low and high, if you look back here, right, again, we're seeing a little bit more of a low level severity, 
moderate level of severity. And as we go upslope, though, we're seeing a higher level of severity. So let's take a look at the photos. Four to six months following fire, we have a little bit of rain on the ground right now. And um, I'm going to advance these photos. This is one year, right? And pretty amazing, the level of flush out of vegetation that has occurred through this. Um, we can see that some of these thin bark madrones and smaller coast live oaks did not make it in this moderate level of severity. And um, this is um, two years out in the winter. Uh, so again, flushing out and uh, lots of poison oak. And the other thing is now we'll look at two and a half years out and keep an eye on this piece of flagging that's wrapped around the twig, right? You see that? There it is right there. That's the same wrap. I guess I'll put, I'm pointing at it, but I should put that there. That's the same wrap. That's this wrap around the twig is actually this wrap, right? And so, so this last photo <clears throat> is a little bit reflective for me is that you know, when we think about from our watershed from top to bottom and how they regenerate following fire, is that those knob cone pines are going to come back up on top. They're going to become a park, a, a, a um, they're going to have a high degree of coverage over that ridge. Chaparral is going to open up. It's going to start resprouting. It's amazing to watch that leaf litter cover so quickly and resprouting happen so fast. And, um, but as we work our way down that slope, right, and we start getting back into our oaks or our Douglas firs or hardwood trees that are more open, I'm guessing by now that people have identified the species that's most prominent in this photo, and it's, it's blue blossom. It's Ceanothus thrissiflorus. And, um, you know, at first you look at this and you're like, wow, this is a huge amount of brush. And, um, and I didn't really recognize how, what the value of Ceanothus thrissiflorus was until I was at the UC Big Creek Reserve. And I, and I was hiking out of some of their areas of fire back to one of their hot springs and recognized that there was, um, there was a stand of Ceanothus that was probably 20 or 25 years old. And what was happening is it was creating little microclimates in the bottom of the forest and, and little shaded areas where I started seeing little ferns growing up up on top and I'm like, Wow, that's that's super interesting. It, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of anthropomorphisms, but in a lot of way, the forest knows what to do, and it's how we work or live with it. Is how, well, how we'll continue to live with it. So, but it but the uh, and the last part about this is we looked into this a little bit more. And by the way, don't take my word for it. There's a lot of great literature out there to review, and I would recommend that other steps that you guys are thinking about taking as landowners you should look into that literature review. But one of the things about Ceanothus is as it grows up, you know, they always say, well, you know, blue blossom, I'm sort of using Ceanothus and blue blossom interchange, interchangeably, is that they, well, they're nitrogen fixtures. And I'm like, well, is that, is that nitrogen nodules or what is that? Is it in the bottom of the root system? But what's happening is as that Ceanothus is getting taller and it's creating that shaded environment, it's sort of self pruning and it's dropping its Ceanothus leaves to the bottom. And that's what's acting as the nitrogen fixtures for the soil to again, create those microclimates. And I realized that what I was seeing was the Ceanothus forest at UC Big Creek Reserve 25 years out. And this was more recent and that the results after the 1948 fire pre-2009 was that next tier, right? That's the whole cycle that's going on out here. So it's super important to consider that. And just the same, it's super important to consider this as how you decide to redevelop your, um, your places and to take this kind of regeneration into consideration, not only how you do home hardening, but how you decide where you ultimately decide to build if you have room. I recognize that not everybody does, but at least some level of vegetation management to try to reduce the impact of what's happening. Um, and I would add to this that another thing that sort of came out of this was, this is the latest um, severity map um, showing the burned area from CAL FIRE. Right, and um, don't worry about this little line here right now, but you can kind of see these green areas are less severe and are red or more severe. And as it gets to kind of a whiter, we can see a whiter hot ash uh, in these burn photos too. It gives us an idea of what the level of severity is, excuse me. And, uh, and I started looking at this and then I started looking at this spot and this spot was more distinctly white. 
And one thing I started remembering about the ceanothus is that when the sun comes down and that ceanothus takes off out of the ground, there's likely a much higher degree of mortality in the stand because the sunlight's getting through and it's regenerating that ceanothus. And as these tops start to fall out of the dead trees and into the ceanothus, well, um, I think it's creating a new fuel dynamic. And, and I would say that, that the jury's still out. Like, I think we're just starting to talk about this, but when I pull up the burn severity map <clears throat> of the Lockheed fire and I look at where its footprint is and I put that predominant footprint over this area and I can see that, so I'm just, I think there's gonna be some time and a lot of us professionals thinking about, was there a change in the level of severity due to the change? And, and we, know that the, we know that the climate's warming, right? There's, there's, that's, that's what's happening. But at the same time, we're also a hundred years behind from, from uh, you know, allowing fire through some of these areas. And we know that native peoples predominantly had a frequency return interval of fire of, of maybe around 12 years as some of the work from Scott Stevens out of Cal Berkeley. And I'm, I'm sure there's some other people on this, um, um, uh, on this presentation who could chime in on that. So we have climate, we have a lot of catch up going on. And so that's, that's of real interest to me. So that being said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that lie a little bit. I'm just gonna run through a few more photos here because I want you guys again to sort of test your burn severity. I think that's one of the most important things that you can walk away from. So I'm gonna pull up these photos and I just want you thinking in your head, low, moderate, high, very high, right? So first set of photos, four to six months after the fire, redwood stand in the bottom, we have some class, we have some flow down a water course. Um, and little sprouting, lots of leaf litter down here. Probably some crown remaining up on top that's reducing um, a lot of um, regeneration in the bottom of the forest floor. Um, here again, Douglas fir stand. I'm not going to say the severity this time. Um, that has some oaks in it, lots of leaf litter, and some sprouting four to six months. Some sprouting of small herbaceous species four to six months. A steeper slope. Um, Again, four to six months, um, small regeneration starting to happen of ferns under this canopy. Uh, then we're gonna move a year out and we'll see that same redwood stand in the bottom that has some level of regeneration. Still have some uh, trees here that are expiring, it looks to be tan oaks. Um, and then we have a really steep hill slope that um, has a level of uh, chaparral on it, some small oak trees on it. And just keep an eye on this, this photo is gonna come up again. We are one year out from the fire in the summer and, and not Salma said what severity it was, I'm not going to, but you can see a lot of understory that's coming up and um, a lot of sprouting going on on this oak tree, a little bit questionable, definitely gonna have a degree of defect in its structural integrity as you move forward. A lot of the fir trees start making it, I'll let you name the severity. Um, this is down more in a riparian area. I think you can identify the se severity level. Lots of um, red elderberry coming up, wood ferns, some sword ferns, redwood sorrel, uh, looking pretty good, right? Next one, so now we're two years out, right? Winter of 2011, remember that hill slope? Let's go back and look at that hill slope right there. One, two, three, four, there it is again. Some pretty serious regenerative capacity in just over two years. Um, then we move on again and we look at this oak uh, tree area again. Kind of green, definitely trying to do something. Got a chance. Um, this is a great photo because it points out the intermediary step between that log that you saw that was split in half and it being taken over after a burn. And that's what's happening. These, this is that carbohydrate storage that's sprouting. All these other limbs are dead. It's gonna put new limbs out and it's gonna entomb these trees in the center. Pretty amazing. Lots of understory vegetation coming up here. Um, now we're at summer 2012. Here's that picture again of that redwood stand. See a lot more sprouting and um, you can see higher mortality. These trees are starting to fall over a little bit. May have opened up some more sunlight to the forest floor and kind of an iterative process. Go figure. So here's the oak trees again. Pretty green, but I'm starting to see some bark drop off some of these limbs. So jury's still out, but look who's coming up. Here's the ceanothus right here. That's gonna see some of these wood tops into it. And then we also have another set from summer 2013, shows that regenerative cap capability four years later in the burn area really coming up. There's the oaks again, the ceanothus is getting higher. Uh, and what severity? In three, two, one. 
low severity, right? Good regenerative capacity. <clears throat> and so this brings us to our conclusion, right? We were really trying to help landowners understand burn severity, forest regeneration, and the basics for assessing tree mortality on coastal tree species following wildfire to support informed decision-making regarding tree removal. So I just wanna say one more time that assessing tree mortality and damage following wildfire is highly subjective and includes many more factors than considered in this presentation. Be sure to consider the support of an appropriate professional in your decision-making process regarding decisions on tree removal. And uh, this is the last slide, which is just essentially acknowledgements to let you know how many people were involved in the work in 2009 and then other people that have been added to this project to help uh, move this message on with others. And thanks to both RCDs and to all these people on this list who really helped put this together and help make us decisions in 2009. And a lot of these people are still here and gonna help us make decisions now. So um, there's a link to a little bit more information that um, Angie will have on, um, I think the RCD website. And with that, a, a very grateful thank you to all and, um, and uh, press on, <laughs> press on. Thank you. Well, Steve, thank you so much for that. I wish we could have a little claps. <laughs> it's so strange when we're not here with, um, when we're not able to see each other. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and stick around for questions. This is being recorded, so if folks have a, a deadline of leaving at seven, know that this will be recorded and it will get posted so that you will be able to go back and, and forward through and just listen to the Q&A section. Um, I am gonna go, and again, we will, everybody that was registered will get an email. We'll send out when the videos are posted. So please share them with your friends if you, if you thought that they were useful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt, who has been collecting. There's quite a few questions, so we'll get through as many as we can. If we can't answer them all, um, we'll see how long Steve wants to stick around. We will um, try to answer them later, or we will get answers later, and we'll post them um, on our website. That might take about a week to get the rest of the questions answered. But Matt, if you want to take it away, that would be sure. great. Yeah. We had a lot of great questions. I tried to group them together to, to give you just a, a quick <laughs> one sentence line. Um, the one that I think is coming up a lot is just if you can provide a little bit of clarification specific to redwood regeneration and fire resiliency. Um, tied in with that question, just as, um, specific questions about bark being able to regrow and push out the burn scars as well as um, how you should manage redwood as it's growing back, if you should be thinning any regeneration or just um, leave it alone. You're muted, Steve. Steve, you're, you're muted. Steve, you're muted. <laughs> that would be important. A great way to answer questions. Um, so I think there were sort of three questions there. The first one was about redwood resiliency, and I, and maybe people are are wanting me to to I sort of affirm the fact that I that I believe that um, the resiliency of redwoods is is very strong. And um, I was thinking about explaining those genetics in that manner um, about their level of capability is amazing, and I think that you um, are going to see you know, a, a lot of those redwoods uh, continue to proliferate. They're, they're gonna be set back a little bit while their roots regroup. And some areas that burn super hot, those cambiums are gonna grow back around and seal that, right? We were talking about the burn scars too. Matt, did I get, am I getting to the heart of that first question? Is that- I think it, yeah. People are after too, okay. And, and maybe talk about how um, redwood as a species is fire adaptive and, and already more resilient and other tree species. It might be good to touch on that a little more in depthly. Okay, so, um, well, um, I guess what I, I mean, when I think about that question, I think about sort of our, uh, how our species occupation has changed over time. And, and um, but really, I, I, from what we know from some of the research that I've looked into here, um, that, you know, redwoods, at least in the area of the 2009 Lockheed fire, 
there's a really interesting study on Laguna de las Troncas, which is a research study where they were uh, coring down into that pond up there to try to find tephra, right, from um, ash from volcanoes. Um, and they ultimately found this tephra. I think they found ash that had come from a volcano in Oregon, but they also found um, pollen deposits. And uh, I won't talk too much about the other pollen deposits, but I, I think they started finding pollen deposits for redwoods about 12,000 years ago here. So we know that they've had a long resiliency. We know that their survivability, certainly of old growth trees, is, uh, is extensive. And um, they, um, maybe I should have just used the word fire adaptive more, but I think with the, what they're the result of their genetic change and how they've evolved over time in the system, that they're absolutely fire adaptive. And um, it's probably, you know, part of how they've maneuvered themselves in the system to stay viable as long as, as they have too. So I have a feeling I'm probably not hitting that, and I'm sure it's one of my peers is shaking their head at me right now. So <laughs> apologies, I'm sure you will follow up with me. Um, but, um, and so maybe moving on from that, the burn scars question, was it a little bit more clarification about the idea that the cambium can push and seal up areas essentially where, like when we saw that one photo with the, with the forester putting his foot up where the bark um, was completely gone in there. There, there is potential for cambium to creep all the way up around that and seal it. And that's what I was trying to show in that log that was split in half. Excuse me, is that amazing capability of that redwood to entomb or enclose those wounds from that fire? Adaptive behavior. <laughs> there we go. So, second part to that question is: if you see a fully burnt redwood that's still alive, will it always look burned or? Will new bark push out the burned outer yeah. layer? I mean, you'll probably see evidence of the burn for years, but if you if you go all the way back to my first presentation photo, I was trying to show that tree from the 1985 Lexington fire that had healed over, and you actually don't see any black marks on it, but I guarantee there were black marks all over that tree. So it'll take some years that um, you'll see some of that black blackness go away. It'll split, and there'll be fresh bark coming out, and you'll still see the remnant, not in the furrow of the bark, but on the plate of the park, that'll still be black as, as time proceeds. And th there was a question about, about thinning and could maybe you ask me that question again? So I'm, I I'm going to kind of change that question, add a little bit more to it. Um, there was a few questions about fire return intervals and how specifically the Santa Cruz mountains, how we should be preparing our regenerative, regenerative forests in burned areas. Um, and so I'm going to direct that question as should you be thinning regrowth of all species, maybe not just specific to redwood. And um, the specific question is, can't the new growth become a new fire risk? So maybe tie that into a, one answer. <laughs> well, the Ceanothus definitely is. And the dead treetops falling back into the Ceanothus is definitely a new fire risk. Um, the um, thinning of the forest, um, yeah, you can add some regeneration in the forest floor, but you know, really what you're trying to develop, just like with a lot of the fuels reduction projects that are out there, is you're trying to develop a shaded fuel break, right? So you're trying to develop a canopy over the top. And in some cases, if we want to try to, you know, if we want to try to create a forest dynamic to grow faster and we reduce some of the competition in the understory, that growth that occurs on that acre of land and wood is gonna to go to hopefully the larger trees that you leave behind to try to generate a canopy that creates a level of separation between the ladder fuels and the upper canopies. So um, I think it's really situational. There are definitely places where you can, where you can thin, where you're gonna increase that component. And, um, and, and maybe that's part of what has to happen over time to start building a shaded fuel break over time too to add to that. Good and, and Steve, I think we could, if there's a lot of folks still on, so let's just keep answering okay. the questions and see where we are at seven. We can go for another 10 minutes and then check in and see if folks are still there. We can still, if you are still around, let us know. Okay. <laughs> you need to go. I'll do my best. 
Um, there's a lot of specific questions about time frame of when landowners should start assessing their trees, how long do they have um, to make assessments specifically for hazard trees or um, uh, to determine what trees survived. Um, and then there are questions about who can perform that kind of services for them. Well, I think, I think the first part is that when we're thinking about timing, you know, um, um, I feel like for the landowners too, there's a lot of steps that have to happen maybe before we get to the trees, right? There's going to be a level of hazardous material removal, potentially debris removal off of sites. And then at some point before, you know, more major infrastructure goes in, then that's probably when you're going to start thinking about your hazard trees. So, um, I mean, you can, you know, as things need to cool down a little bit more, like some of these areas are, may not, um, totally cool down until the rain hits them in the winter. So there's a matter of safety involved when you're doing your assessment, which I tried to mention a little bit of. And, um, and at the same time, it's good to get a little bit of a flush out on the trees, depending on, you know, you're assessing your level of severity. You're like, okay, low, probably pretty good, moderate, not too bad, high and very high. You're like, mm, we're probably going to have to take a closer look at these trees. So you might want to let them flush out just a little bit, get things to start going, see where the regeneration capacity is going to, going to come in in the winter. And you'll, you'll probably start really getting a good idea in springtime, but there's always a settling period, you know, you may have hazard trees and the winds are going to come up in winter time and there, there could definitely be some blow down there. So in that case, if you think there's those kinds of risks, then that's something you're going to try to look at sooner. So I'm sorry, it's not a perfect one word answer, but it's, it's variability about what your goals are. If you're going to rebuild your house, you're going to want to get those trees out of there before you start doing major construction out of there. If there are hazard trees, right? <clears throat> if you have the time, you might want to let the land heal some, you know, up into, you know, late winter, early spring when things have had a chance to set up if you can. Um, <clears throat> um, and or more immediate hazards where your house is still standing and you've has what you think are hazard trees next to it. Well, then you're looking at someone to evaluate that a little bit sooner. Um, <clears throat> I think the, and I'm sorry, what was the last part of that question? That was um, when to evaluate. And the last part of the question was who, uh, who provides services to well, evaluate? Um, I mean, there's a, an array of tree service professionals out there, licensed arborists, right? Um, they're uh, registered professional foresters. And, and I think, you know, everybody's a little bit concerned about their capability. And I, a lot of us has been talking about how, how do we try to generate this message to as many people as we can. And, you know, thank goodness for the RCDs trying to you know, put groups of people together and, and um, try to make visits where there are maybe more groups there at one time to try to get people down those paths. So um, those are probably some of the main professionals. There are other qualified professionals out there who could likely do some of those assessments. Um, depends on the level of permitting that you might ultimately need to consider. There are some um, more generalized, easy permits for clearances around homes through CAL FIRE. Um, so those are things to, things to consider a little bit too. Um, and then, uh, a lot of people are just interested in reading more about, um, specifically fire recovery and, um, fire adaptive forests. Do you have any book recommendations or resources that you know offhand? Um, you know, I know that, um, that was a little bit of a discussion item between you guys and Angie. And I, I think there's kind of some ideas about a list culminating. Um, uh, so I might say that because it, it can be topic specific. You know, when you ever get into a research paper, they usually are drilled pretty specifically about maybe certain items too. So um, I think that might be coming. Steve, can I ask one thing? Some of this came up early. Um, a lot of folks were asking about your animation and is that something publicly available or not at the beginning? The uh, time lapse of the fire. Oh, the progression of the fire. Um, I, I think so. I mean, I asked if I could put it on, but um, you know, maybe that's one follow up. We could just check in with the people that we got it from and uh, see how they're feeling about the fire progression. Uh, Great, thank you. Okay, I'll write that down.
Do you have any more, Matt? Any big burning questions that we didn't get to? Um, wanna... one, one final one I think we can address as one question is, uh, is um, the understory vegetation, how, how will additional understory vegetation return after a fire? Um, specifically looking at like English ivy or other invasives as well as natives that might come in under? Um, well, I, I think, I mean, hopefully that question is to, is to bring out the point that invasives can definitely begin to occupy a site after wildfire. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, um, notably for areas that I was familiar with, we definitely had um, reoccupation of French broom and additional occupation a French broom and, and you know, the, the, the forest grows with sunlight <clears throat> and you open up the forest floor and it's about who's going to get there the fastest and, um, and, and the strongest root systems are the ones that are able to push out trees to get up above it. Ceanothus is, is super fast, but so is French broom too. So that's definitely a concern to think about when removing um, overstory in areas that have some level of occupation by invasive species. It's, it's good to think about some level of treatment to try to occur there, for sure. It's a reality. Great. Um, unless, Andrew, you saw anything I didn't, I think the, that covers the, the major questions and maybe the rest we, we can come up with some answers and, and share within the next week. Yeah, perfect. That sounds great. Um, thank you, Steve.